in written sources the Chu River was first mentioned in the travel essays by the Buddhist monk Xuanzang. He was not only a stray preacher and scout of the Tang Empire, but as we say today, a travel blogger. He left numerous travel stories which for many centuries served as the main source of information about Central Asia. Having conquered the Ten Shan mountain passes, the monk went to Lake Issakul and arrived in the city of Suyab, the winter headquarters of the Kagans of the Western Turkic Khaganate. The city was located in the valley of the Suyab River. Subsequently, more than once the river had changed its course as well as the name – Suyab, Sui, Ju, Su, Shui, Chui and Chui. Listening to all these names carefully, they all have an obvious same root. Chu or Shu or Su in different languages means river or water, and has a lot more to it than a mere water body component. Rivers were always the place giving birth to civilizations. Civilizations appeared and vanished on the fertile shores of the Shu, gardens blossomed and then were covered with the sands of time. Life boiled and then faded here, as if hiding from something or somebody. The river Shu, Moyung Kum Desert, as well as the Kantao and Anarakai Mountains have always attracted my attention, not only because these are amazing and mysterious places, but also because they possess a rich historical past. In the age of geographical discoveries, the Shu River became the object of fierce disputes between researchers. Some believed that it flowed from Lake Isakul, others argued that, on the contrary, it flowed into it. Only in 1856, Simeon of Tenchansky managed to solve one part of this riddle. The left tributaries of the Shu River, Jorn Arik and Koch Kor, originate in the Teske Alatau and carry their waters directly to Issakul. But literally a few kilometers from the lake, the river sharply turns to the north. The Shu acquires its real power after merging with the Chon Kamin River, originating in the glaciers of the Chilik Kamin mountain plexus, some 30 kilometers from Almaty city. Here, where the Transili Alatau and Kungay Alatau ranges merge, 46 glaciers with a total area of 128 square kilometers are concentrated. The Shu is a snow and ice fed river, and thus its fate largely depends on the state of the Tenshine glaciers. We are at monitoring station of the Institute of Geography and Water Security of Kazakhstan on Big Almaty Lake. Nikolai, how long have you personally been observing glaciers? And what changes have you noticed during this time? In 1958, there was an expedition. German surveyors, jointly with the staff of the Institute of Geography, made a detailed tachymetric survey of the upper glacial cirque of the Kishi Almatinka River. Exactly 40 years later, in 1988, they did the second survey, in which I took part as well. So, over these 40 years, the glaciers, in particular our Tuyuksu glacier, as well as other glaciers in the area, have lost about 40% of their mass. We have been observing virtually the same dynamic over the past 30 years, that is, about 0.8% loss per year in the area and about 1% loss in volume. We can say that during the entire period of direct observations, the glacier has been losing on average 1 million cubic meters a year. The sources of the Shu River are stormy and furious. The mighty force of water cuts its way through rocks, 
There are relatively few people in the mountains. Cattle breeding is developed, but in general, the economic impact on mountain ecosystems is insignificant. Although environmentalists have been sounding the alarm that in some places fragile mountain ecosystems suffer from overgrazing. Nevertheless, mountain coniferous forests with a rich and diverse animal world have survived in the upper streams of the rivers. Here you can encounter mountain goats or take care, tenshan bear, and if you get lucky, even a snow leopard. What will happen to these ecosystems in, say, 50 years? What will happen to the Shu River and its valley if glacier melting does not slow down? Scientists, politicians and public organizations are seeking for solutions. In 2015, the project Promoting Transboundary Cooperation and Integrated Water Resources Management in the Shu and Talas River Basin was launched with the support of several international organizations. Its objectives include the analysis of climate change scenarios and search for ways of adaptive shared water resources management. Researchers and NGOs jointly with the specialists of the Committee of Forestry and Animal World have developed a number of measures to stop the devastating impacts of desertification. Merging mountain tributaries form the copious Shu River, which, entering the plain, completely changes its character and turns into a calm floodplain stream. For centuries, the waters of the Shu have served people for irrigating their gardens and fields. On the territory of Kazakhstan, the Shu crosses the Shu and Moyunkum districts of Jambil region. The river gradually gives away its water, shallows, spills across lakes and dull riverbeds, waterlogs and gets lost in the sands near the northern border of the Moyunkum desert. After all, a proverb says all rivers flow into the sea, and researchers of the past had unsuccessfully searched for the mysterious sea into which the shoe flows. According to some hypotheses, it had once carried its water to the Sirdarya, and according to others, it had flowed into Lake Balkash. Most likely, they are all true, but now the shoe brings the remains of its water to the Betpagdala desert and evaporates there like a glass of water splashed onto a hot pan. Traces of irrigation canals in the waterless Betpagdala desert indicate that the local climate was once wetter and there was more water. Our small expedition is heading to the Shu Valley with the team of archaeologists to not only tell our viewers about the implementation of environmental programs in the region, but also to get acquainted with the antiquities of this amazing area. I really like to go and join expeditions with the outdoor world and not just because we are friends. Archaeology and natural studies, despite their being completely different sciences, are closely related. As an archaeologist, I know that at all times people chose the most convenient places for living. It is necessary to have water, fertile pastures and land. Abundance of animals for hunting is also vital. Such joint expeditions help environmentalists understanding the origins of various current phenomena and environmentalists vice versa help us better understand the past. We are in Moyun Kum district of Jambil region. We need to stop by in the village of Berlik to coordinate our route with forestry and wildlife protection specialists. Let's go to the office now, get to know everyone and make a plan of our further actions. Hello, how are you? Salam alaikum. Bakit Mezatayuli. Our film crew has heard a lot about your region. What are the most attractive historical, cultural and natural sites here? 
научные достопримечательности в этом районе. Безын Коктюри Орман Шарвашлан Жирнде, Табиры Орман Сиксивил Никсбюсетна. Our Коктюрак Forestry has a lot of saxaul. And our Mount Jambaltau borders on the Kantau Mountains. In the east, we have Lake Balkash. As to animals, we have black-tailed gazelles, jayruns and argali. They've introduced kulans in the Andasai Reserve, which are reproducing quite well. The argali mostly inhabits the Kantau Mountains. Concerning the local historical and cultural sites, Mount Kozebasi, for instance, is located on the territory of our forestry. We have a couple of medieval settlements. We should definitely check them out. Bantea bin Azar Baba is our main historical personality. At present, our main job is cultivating saksaul. We are currently engaged in plowing works. Let's go there, and you will see it for yourself. We got information that they've seen black archaeologists or tomb raiders in Moyunkum district. These are people who illegally research archaeological monuments. What can you say about that? Thank you for this very relevant question. In the Kokterak forestry, there are two reserves, Andasai and Jusandala. We haven't registered any such cases or violations. If you suddenly become aware of such facts in our forestry, please notify us. We patrol our premises quite often. We did not encounter anything like this so far. You have a large territory. Do you know how many Argali and Jayrans live here? There are two reserves on the territory of the Kokterak forestry, Andesai and Jusandala. The Jusandala covers the area of 326,000 square kilometers, and the Andesai about 126,000 square kilometers. Their total area is 468,770 hectares. Based on our estimates, we have 56 Argali and 154 Jayrans. Have there been any cases of poaching? Not very many. Sometimes during the fall and spring hunting seasons, hunters do come here. But we did not have any cases of illegal hunting for red-listed animals. We conduct frequent raids. The Okodzo prom inspectors also come here often to patrol the area. The Sapsan Special Task Force also comes here every once in a while, so gross violations are practically non-existent. To our traditional question about the development of local tourism, Bakit Mezatayuli has honestly said that it is a matter of distant future. Currently, we don't have anything like this. There are a few lakes and rivers on the forestry's territory, 
and there are plans for boosting tourism in the future. I suggest us driving through the territory of our forestry, seeing the Argali and Saxaul forests with your own eyes. Your audience will definitely like it too. Scientists have calculated that one Saxaul tree secures four tons of sand. Saxaul binds sand with its roots and does not allow the winds to spread the sand in different directions. Just one tree can save one house from the coming desert. Given the water stress and the acceleration of desertification, the role of Saxaul is particularly high. And although its cutting is already prohibited, this ban must be supported by everybody. Do you remember the movie when an Arnold Schwarzenegger's character is sent from the future to save the world? So these guys who are now planting Saxaul also appear to us as the messengers of future civilizations. What they are doing today will affect the lives of subsequent generations who will live in Moyenkum district in 50 years. Are you drying these seeds? They are ready. And the only additional thing we need to do is to sieve them. How many survive? About 80% reach germination. How many years a tree needs to reach the commercial age? About 15, 20. Now we will go to the field. We have many seven to eight year old trees there. There's no sense in logging them. Only 25 and over are good for cutting. In our market time, when everybody likes quick return investment, growing successful forests for the sake of future generations is, of course, a noble cause. We are now in the field where the fall saxaul sowing is taking place. Currently 450 hectares of land are undergoing ploughing. The main purpose of planting Saksaul is to stop the Moyenkum, so they do not reach the villages. These measures also have a beneficial effect on the reproduction of birds. The area of our seeding nursery is 10 hectares. As of today, we have prepared four tons of Saksaul seeds. In the future, we plan to expand the area of our Saksaul plantations. In summer, we protect them from fires. In autumn, we are ploughing the fields. Due to desertification, tens of thousands of square kilometers of land degrade annually across the planet. The process has accelerated in recent decades. In Kazakhstan, out of 182 million hectares of pasture land, 14 million hectares were completely decommissioned and the total degradation area exceeds 50 million hectares. The government of Kazakhstan has declared the restoration of Saksaul forests one of its green economy priorities. I am a forester at Kokterek. This time we intend to plough about 450 hectares of land. 400 hectares have been already ploughed based on the standard depth of 20 to 22 centimetres and 3.15 metres between furrows. We are heading to Binazar Aul. 
It was named after Bhatia bin Azar Akedeluli, who made a lot of good for this region. We're especially interested in his hydro-engineering efforts that allowed connecting the Shu River with a system of irrigation canals. Surprisingly, this project was carried out 200 years ago and had successfully operated for many years. The monument to the Bhatir is installed right near the highway, but you need to drive a dozen kilometers to the tomb along a country road. We are now at the place where Bin Azar Baba is buried. Bin Azar Baba lived in 1802-1860. In one of the battles with the Kokand Khanate, he killed the Kokand Batir and was proclaimed Batir himself thereby receiving the blessing from Supatai Baba. Bin Azar Baba had faithful associates, Supatai Baba, Agibai Baba and Bolterik Shishen. They made a huge contribution to the development of agriculture, from Tulkubas to Moyenkum and along the coast of the Shu River. He was one of those who built many canals in these lands and accustomed the locals to settling and farming. By profession, Akil Khan Madikanov is a forester. He showed us the canal that his great-grandfather built 200 years ago. The canal stretched for tens of kilometers from the Shu River and recently water was running along it. Amidst the sandy desert, the traces of former fields are easily noticeable. Kirbas Baba is buried here. I'm his great-great-grandson. Once these places were called Kankarala and Kunanbai Volast. His son Zainabil died of a sudden illness and he decided to build this mausoleum. Kirbas himself and his second son Madi Khan are also buried here. Madi Khan's grandson Kushaman in due time built a water canal here and was engaged in agriculture. Talgar Taskarov, Deputy Director of Kokterek Institution for the Protection of Forests and Wildlife, invites us to dinner according to the traditional law of steppe hospitality. Before the long road awaiting us, it will not hurt getting some good homemade food. From the Shu River to the south-north, there stretch the sands of Moyenkum. In the east, they go up to the Shu Ili Mountains. The name of these mountains speaks for itself. They represent a series of small ranges stretching in separate massives between the Shu River and Balkash region. The paleontological history of the Shu Ili Mountains is so rich that even its shortest retelling would require a whole monograph. Once it was a seabed and then as a result of stormy tectonic processes, high glacier-covered mountains formed. These were the northern spurs of the Transili Alatau. The tireless time had erased the mountain peaks and turned them into rocky hillocks. Paleobotanists have found petrified remains of vascular plants in the Shuili Mountains that used to grow here 420 million years ago, even prior to the appearance of dinosaurs. Traces of ancient rivers are telling us that once the local climate was less arid, and numerous archaeological finds indicate that people lived here in the Stone, Bronze and Early Iron Ages due to favorable environmental conditions. 
We hope to encounter J. Rons and Dargali here and our friends archaeologists to search the desert and mountains for previously unknown architectural monuments, ancient encampments and rock paintings. To get to the Shuili Mountains, you need to cross the Trans-Kazakhstan Railway. It turned out to be not very difficult, but we had to give it some effort. The railway is a part of our recent history. In the 30s of the last century, the famous Turk Sib was one of the main construction projects of the first five-year plan. No doubt it was a huge economic achievement, but there was also a disadvantage which is beginning to cause concern among environmentalists today. The railway tracks cut across the traditional wild animal migration routes, foremost Jairans and Saigon. Here comes the first find. Maxim, в руках у меня свод памятников. Maxim, in my hands here I have the catalog of monuments of Moyenkum district of Jambil region. The Oljabala Mound burial site, for instance, dates from the early Iron Age and Bronze Age. It was discovered in 1989 under the guidance of archaeologist Ismagilov. It was additionally investigated in 2009. What's so unique about this burial ground? There are more than 150 archaeological sites, of which only no more than 50 were investigated so far. As we can see, this is a group burial site. They buried bodies in stone boxes typical for the early Iron Age. Suddenly, in the middle of the flat desert, we see some high ground. Foresters have set up an observation tower there. Only after returning to the city, Arman managed to identify the find in literature. During the expedition, we visited the Ulken Tobe settlement, dating from the 7th 12th centuries, the early Muslim period. It was a fortified settlement with a double row of walls and four watchtowers. This settlement was discovered in 1946 by academician Magulan. Apparently, it was one of the guard posts on the Great Silk Road and was built by the order of Western Turkey Kagans. After the Karakanids gained power over the Shu Valley, they used this steppe fortification to protect their borders. The cultural lay of the 13th century indicates that the fortification was destroyed. Perhaps it happened during the conquest of the Karakanid Empire by the Mongols. Now the former settlement is also inhabited, with grey gerbils. These pretty animals are also participants of some stormy historical events. Which one, you would ask? A small flea lives on their bodies, which is the carrier of a plague bacillus, Yersinia pestis. In the 14th century, with one of the caravans, the evil bacteria traveled along the Great Silk Road all the way to Europe, killing almost one-third of its then population. We see a vehicle ahead. We need to check it out. We just scared off a group of black archaeologists. They quickly got in their jeep and tried to escape from us. So far they are succeeding. Will we be able to catch up with them? Behind the wheel here we have the unsurpassed Dima Karlov. He will not lose them. Do you see the dust ahead? It looks like we're getting closer and closer to them. We're about to catch up. Damn, they're coming off again. That's it. I think we lost them. 
we took a wrong turn somewhere. We didn't get lucky this time and they managed to outwit us at one of the turns apparently. We will still continue our hunt for black archaeologists. We we'll still have a day tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. The Saxaul Desert is left behind and we are climbing the Kantau Mountains. In the distance, on the horizon, we notice several animal silhouettes. What are they? Jayrons or Agave? Sometimes you can encounter Jayrons in the hills, but they primarily prefer foothill deserts. The Agali, on the contrary, prefer uplands and rocky areas, as it's cooler there in summer and it's also more convenient to escape from predators there. For sure, these are Agali. Adam Balas men tabiqat bir-bir men tig'iz baylanishi bo'lgandan mnaw o'rman Nature and humans are closely interrelated. Our ancestors left it for us. Therefore, wherever you are, I urge you to preserve the wealth of our nature for the coming generations. Xalq bo'lib, el bo'lib, yurt bo'lib birga qo'ruqqa chaqiraman. Over the past half century, the number of Jayrons in the region has significantly dropped, and two specially protected areas were established to preserve them. Jusandala State Reserve Zone of Republican Significance and Andesai State Nature Reserve. In the late 1980s, they resettled a group of Kulans here. At first, the animals felt well, but during the 1990s crisis, their population was badly damaged. In recent time, two more batches of Kulans were brought to the Andesai Reserve from the Altinamel National Park. Now the updated population is developing normally. Along the way, we noticed several groups of Argali and Jayrans. We want to try to get them on video, but it is almost impossible to do this in high quality from a vehicle. In open space, ungulates are especially careful. They can notice a person from a distance of one kilometer and immediately flee. Yet the frequent encounters still suggest that the animals are under good protection. Vast flat valleys stretch between mountains and hills. In just one day, we saw 28 black-tailed gazelles. Of course, you will not call such an excursion a counting mission, but we got good overall impression. Apparently, we are on the banks of an ancient river that flowed here years and years ago. In any case, no later than the early Iron Age, because on its rocky shores we found an encampment of ancient metallurgists. This, guys, apparently is a Bronze Age extraction site. The ancient metallurgy. 3,000 years ago, this is how they mined bronze here. The rock paintings near the site suggest that the ore extraction for ancient metallurgists was associated with some rituals. Possibly an archer. And these here are not Agali but Teke. If the drawings depict Teke mountain goats, then it's likely that they once lived here. We are in the center of the Anarakai Mountains. Our task is to find Kulans, Jayrans, Argali, Bastards, as well as explore several archaeological sites. We have managed to encounter all the animals that Arman wanted to see, and not only live, but also in the form of petroglyphs. From the height of 500 meters, the ancient riverbed is clearly visible. And it is directed straight to Balkash, only 70 kilometers away.
We are continuing on our journey and unexpectedly stumble upon another meteorological site. On the way, we suddenly saw dumps. We got interested and decided to explore them. It looks like black archaeologists worked here. The trench stretches 50 meters along the hillside. Well, this is a gold vein. Or rather, this rock is rich in quartz. It is known that quartz accompanies gold and gold accompanies quartz. So what they did was they gouged the whole trench along the quartz seam looking for gold. You still need to get it to the processing factory to enrich. Yes, they crush it to dust and then get the mercury out. Mercury evaporates on its own. Piles of rocks, hills, steep slopes and amidst all this there are wide inter-mountain plains. We are approaching a zone generating a lot of enthusiasm among archaeologists. We разбили лагерь у подножия Сапун горы. We set up our camp at the foot of the so-called Sapun mountain, not by chance. This is a lonely hill rising above the Anarakai plain. Why? Let Arman answer this question, please. Indeed, we stopped exactly here not by chance, but for several reasons. The second name of the Sapun mountain among local residents is the Khan's camp. From there, the Khans could observe the Battle of Anarakai well known from various sources. But for several years now, researchers have been trying to find the actual site of the Anarakai battle and unfortunately so far to no avail. Now the Sapun mountain will become the starting point of our search and investigation. They say that in good weather from the top of Sapun mountain, you can see Lake Balkash. Although metal objects are prone to rust, over the past 290 years since the Anarakai battle, some artifacts, arrowheads, remains of chain armor and even lead bullets should be still intact. At the time of the battle, they already used firearms. I have participated in many archaeological expeditions, but today I will try on a new hat of a volunteer amateur archaeologist. It turns out it's quite a gambling thing to do. I'm getting some kind of signal. Arman, what does it mean? The signal's code is 5357. Look at that! It's a shell. Are these the traces of the battle? I'd say these are the traces of poachers. We need to call Talgat. The Anarakai plain is so vast that probably a whole life is not enough to fully explore it. The very name, the Anarakai battle, of course, comes from the Anarakai mountains, so it definitely happened somewhere around here. Despite the fact that the search during our short expedition did not yield any results, it doesn't mean that it didn't take place here. We need to expand the search field, especially since the place of this battle has been sought after for more than 50 years. Our expedition is coming to an end. We made a huge circle around the minor village of Mini, located near Lake Balkash. A few more kilometers and we will reach the Karaganda Almaty Highway. 
Although we did not find the site of the Anarakai battle and did not catch the black archaeologists, nevertheless we met some very interesting people passionate about their profession, the true patriots of their native land. We also encountered many wild animals in their natural habitat and saw some astonishing landscapes. I really do hope that Moyunkum will one day become an exciting tourist destination.